Hey guys, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history living in your aquariums. Now, today we're going to be talking about the fish in this aquarium down here, in this 40 breeder. And this is my colony of blue lip buffalo head cichlids from West Africa. They are one of my favorite fish, one of my most dynamic fish, and one of my meanest fish. Let me show you what I mean. Alright, so here are my beautiful fish. These are the blue lip uh, cichlids that I was just talking about. And you can see they've got these really cool red pectoral fins and yellow um, fin finage all over, kind of like an iridescence. And then they've got kind of a cool chain link pattern. Now, this is a female, most likely, the, the little one there. And this is most likely a male, I would assume but not a dominant male, so it's kind of displaying female colors. Now, if anybody's an expert on these, which is probably someone in Europe, because there are hardly any of these in America, um, please let me know. This is my my uh, angry fellow. This is my, my guy who doesn't even want human hands near the tank. He is very angry, and that's because he has a female in a cave that he's protecting and uh, she just actually left the cave so that's kind of interesting but oh here she goes back into the cave but watch what happens when I put even a net in in the tank generally he doesn't he doesn't like the net and he, oh yeah he will really attack it sometimes so yeah he's I mean he he'll rip at this net like fiercely and you can really, I mean, you can really feel feel it. Uh, and, oh, he actually ripped, great. He actually ripped the corners just now of the net. Can you guys see that? So, pretty amazing fish, but clearly very territorial. And the funny thing about this fish is it says peaceful on most listings talking about this cichlid. This cichlid is not peaceful. This cichlid will kill anything in with it uh, when it is spawning. And the dominant male is just a ornery fella all around, even if he's not spawning. So this is the dominant male. Also, it says they only get three inches long. This guy's a good six, maybe even seven inches long. So, I mean, he's, yeah, he's special. So I want to tell you the story about how I got these fish and a little bit of their backstory. You can see that the bettas and things, they're fine. Um, nobody seems to notice them, but the barbs and the petricolas and the other, uh, the other uh, cichlids in the tank, they, they're, they're not around. They are not allowed around even this half of this 40 breeder. So, pretty impressive uh, reaction. I'm going to feed them because when they eat, they're also pretty uh, entertaining to watch too. But we'll do that a little bit later and you can see that they can be like bass. They can be like largemouth bass when they feed. So they're overall a really interesting fish. Let's get into talking about why these are special, why these are threatened and they're on the red list of the IUCN. And let's talk about where I got these because I am one of probably less than a dozen people in the U.S. with these maybe even half a dozen people in the U.S. Uh, because my good friend Lawrence Kent, who's also in the Seattle area and in the uh, Seattle uh, Area Aquarium Society, he bred these and found these in the wild. So let's talk about their story, why they're threatened, and then we'll talk at the end about their care and guidelines and all that info if you're interested in keeping them. But the first part is going to be the secret history of these fish. So let's jump in right now, do the deep dive thing, and uh, I'll comment at the bottom somewhere um, when we'll talk about their care and the parameters and things that they need. All right, let's jump right in. All right, everybody. So I'm just going to film these fish in their tank doing their thing so you guys can get a feel for what they're up to, how they interact with the other fish that are in here, and uh, what they look like. The uh, juvenile one here that's hanging out, and then the uh, couple that's paired off and angry over there <coughs> that ruined my net uh, just a minute ago. So 
We'll go ahead and feed them right before I get to talking about uh, how they should be kept and uh, the water parameters and all that jazz. But until then, I want to tell you guys a story uh, that is about how unusual it is that we have these fish in the United States, period. Now, thankfully, my friend uh, Lawrence Kent brought these back, and then he was able to give the offspring to the Wet Spot Tropical in Portland uh, to a store that sells online. So sometimes you can find these fish, the Irv and I, um, available for sale there at the Wet Spot. However, uh, it's not a sure thing, and it's, it's, it's hit or miss. Now, the other buffalo head species are a little more common, but we're going to get into all that in just a moment. And we're going to talk about why this is the rarest uh, cichlid that I have, one of the rarest fish that I have, uh, or at least tied for it. So, when we're talking about this fish, the Paragobio cichla irvini is what it's known as right now. It is currently listed as threatened threatened <laughs> on the IUCN list, uh, but it will likely be transferred into the red list very soon due to habitat loss uh, and also just, uh, well, I'll tell you the story soon enough. Uh, so, Steatocranus irvini was the name that it was described under by Ethelwyn Trewa Vass in 1943 and she then decided to call it Gobio Chromis Irvini and named it after F.R. Irvine, uh, a collector of West African uh, cichlids and killifish. But in 1976, the fish was reclassified to match with other buffalo head cichlids which uh, kind of have the same nuchal hump or little cranial uh, region that gets enlarged when they're spawning. And so a guy named Tyson Roberts renamed them uh, Steatocranus Irvini uh, in 1976. Now this was always a dubious uh, <laughs> distinction at best because the other species of uh, the Steatocranus uh, were found all the way over in the Congo, and that is 2,000 miles southeast of where th these fish are found in Ghana. So there's a bit of an issue there as far as where they're from, and, and uh, also those fish there are several species and they're pretty common in the hobby and they were always described as peaceful but these fish as you saw when you saw the captain here rip apart my little net uh, and also spit out a Malaysian trumpet snail cracked in half in just a second uh, they are a little less than uh, friendly peaceful relaxed little fish so they got to talking and people decided by around 2010 that they needed a new name and probably a new genus altogether. Uh, they probably needed to be something completely uh, different and uh, they decided on the name uh, of uh, a suggestion by Anton Lamboge who writes for the Cichlid Room Companion, uh, a blog or website on cichlids, and uh, he said that the Irvine I uh, is much more active and is supposed to be related to uh, the two other buffalo head cichlids that are popular in the hobby, the uh, Casarius and the Gibbiceps, but one, obviously, like I just said, they're found really far away from each other, and two, they are uh, not at all the same temperament. These fish, uh, originally before uh, the Volta Dam was constructed, were found in rapids, in fast-moving white water, or a little bit muddy, but you know what I mean, white water. Uh, and they also are quite a bit larger, with the, the dominant males reaching five to seven inches easily, 
And the other ones like these here, reaching three to five inches kind of uh, in between the subdominant males. So he decided that it needed a new name, and so did everyone else, basically. And so in 2019, just three years ago, they redesignated it and created a whole separate genus, genus based on DNA as well as some different variations on uh, the markings on their operculum uh, by their gills, whether it had scales and also some color variations and things. Uh, and they they called it the Para uh, Gobio Cicla Irvini. And so now it's the Para Gobio uh, Cicla Irvini. And that is the blue lip and probably also the green lip uh, variety of this fish. Now, these specific fish are the offspring of some fish caught by my buddy Lawrence Kent on the Volta River near the town of Mangose in Ghana. And he caught these south of the uh, Akosamba Dam, which is also known as the Volta Dam. And the time in the following of the construction of that dam, which was started in 1961, they dammed up a giant river that was a really fertile area for farming. And the Volta River uh, was a very popular uh, agricultural basin. And uh, since they dammed it, there's been a steady decline in agricultural productivity along the lake and all its associated tributaries. So the land surrounding the lake is not nearly as uh, fertile as it used to be, and the land residing underneath the lake um, is where the best stuff used to be because the floods would come every year, and then you'd see uh, nutrients of leaves, dead fish, you know, all sorts of stuff washed thousands of miles of tributaries and rivers and creeks and the main river too all washed out to the ocean but it was you know full of uh all the things that plants and animals need to have a thriving ecosystem plus it was oxygenated and moving now that they've shifted uh the agricultural activity to cattle farming and also using spray on fertilizers and uh, pesticides and things in order to farm on the less fertile land and bringing in GMO crops and other outside uh, quote-unquote innovations but some of these have led to some major problems uh, without that periodic flooding that brought the nutrients to the so uh, soil the natural river flow was pretty much totally halted by the dam while it filled up the reservoir which is the largest man-made lake in the world uh, by surface area and uh, that's the Volta Lake or Lake Volta which has quite a few interesting species but a lot of them are changing as we speak now in fact there's a lot of research papers that have taken note that some of these fish look quite different now than they used to. Like these have become much lighter in color and their heads, their cranial bumps, that is why they're called buffalo heads, are, are not as pronounced um, in the past as they are now. Uh, now they're getting higher and some people think that's because the river doesn't flow as fast, but also their visibility, uh, their color, their markings, the, the brightness of them seems to have gotten more intense, whereas they used to be a much darker color um, with the blue lip standing out and the red pectoral fins standing out, but they used to blend in with the substrate a whole lot more. Um, so that's just one example. This water is full of a lot of species you'll recognize, and we'll talk about that soon when we talk about uh, tank mates. But the runoff from all those new fertilizers and things uh, all along this area, uh, as well as the cattle um, manure and human runoff, has caused eutrophication, giant bacterial cyanobacteria blooms and algae blooms. Uh, the, the water has lost a lot of its oxygen, and it's just led to a lot of... Uh, a lot of really bad ecological uh, problems, kind of a chain reaction type thing. Uh, 
and not least to mention the fact that now there are aquatic plants such as Eurasian milfoil or Matin Grossa uh, that's, that's growing all over the lake as well as, you know, in here we have uh, water lilies and things and those were naturally found along the banks of the river uh, but now they take up much more of the river uh, north east of the dam. Uh, so this could unfortunately be the downfall of this species uh, altogether. These were found just south of the dam on the side of the dam where the river is controlled by the floodgates and so there still is a river but behind it it's a lake and a slow meandering river. But on that lake 300,000 people live and 80,000 of them fish daily. So it's still a really productive lake biologically uh, but these problems are starting to cause more and more uh, issues in disrupting the flow of you know um, food and commerce as well as the invasive plants are wrapping around the props of the uh, the boats and the long the long boats that they use to get around uh, with outboard motors so the Irvine I share uh, the waters with many species of uh, catfish, uh, petricola, um, cynodonis, lots of cynodonis species, uh, and so I've put petricola cynodonis in here. Uh, they also share the water with mormorids, uh, lots of other catfish, featherfin catfish, barbs, gobies, tons of beautiful killifish, which now tend to actually live more in the flooded forests or flooded savanna. Uh, in the wet season, they're kind of seasonal fish a lot of times. Uh, and also they're found with a number of popular uh, hobby fish, the hemichromis, different tilapian cichlids, the fahaka puffer, the limbochromis, the interiochromis, and many, many more, including the peacock jewel cichlids and a whole variety of different offshoots of that. So right now I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to feed these guys for you so you can see how they react during feeding time and why uh, when we talk about care here, this is the care portion, why we need to uh, give them a tank of a certain size and why dither fish that kind of distract them from one another and, uh, and plants and uh, site blocks and caves and why all that stuff's important. So let's take a look at them feeding right now. All right, so I've prepared some blood worms with some uh, baby brine shrimp and also uh, some daphnia for these guys. So we'll see how they like it. And as you can see, they feed ferociously. Uh, the little females, I always make sure they get some too, but they feed very, very savagely. And if I were to have held that back, they strike at the top like crazy. When they're doing this, they oftentimes sift through the substrate or the sand, and so that's how they'll clean up. Uh, so while the catfish are a nice cleanup feature, uh, if you get these, these guys, um, they also are some competition, and they will nip at the Synodonis catfish. So it might be better to get a larger Synodonis species than the Petricola, which aren't necessarily from the same part of the river or anything anyways. Uh, these little uh, fire barbs, um, or African uh, fire barbs, are not exactly what's found with them either, but they are real similar to a lot of the... Um, the other uh, kerosens and uh, longfin tetras and things that are in the water there. Uh, the longfin tetra is found there. You can see that they actually are eating the plant material. Jeez, they go after each other quickly. They're actually eating the plant material as well in, in a rush to eat. So they'll eat like duckweed and any plants in your tank. They'll eat sometimes in a hurry just to eat. Uh, and they're very, like you can see, they're very aggressive in how they eat. So watch what happens if I just get some more blood worms. Just, just strictly blood worms, but th if this guy sees that I'm gonna feed him, he'll know, usually, he'll hit him, or well actually those bettas are gonna get in trouble if I let them get in there. So I'm gonna feed the bettas up here too. But, they know that 
when I'm coming with food. I mean, they're very smart. They see outside the tank. And I actually feel bad right now for them only having a 40-gallon setup. I would say that um, ideally you want a little bit bigger of a set. See, they're, even the little the little male here is is nudging at the the turkey baster for more worms. And there's still worms all over the place. Like, there's still little blood worms. These are chopped up blood worms. There's still blood worms all over the place. So the other thing is, I'm also checking right now to see if they're carrying babies because they're mouth brooders and they'll they'll eat. Um, they'll eat. See, they're right there. He's spitting out sand. So he was cleaning the the blood worms off the sand here, uh, and the catfish will do that. There's also some banjo catfish, which are from South America, in here too, that will do all that. Um, but I just wanted to show you guys that. Now, while they're eating there for a moment, I also want to show you guys that I, I have a couple other fish that are found with them, including this little killifish, the um, Epiplatus uh, panchax, uh, Fungula panchax, um, uh, Drusi, and uh, I, I usually feed these guys uh, also, but they wouldn't make good tank mates. I'm sure they would destroy each other. Now, one cool uh, fish that's found nearby are also these little guys, which are the Enigmatochromius leucansi cichlids. Uh, and they're similar to like a crib in style of body, but they are completely unrelated and a really beautiful purple and blue colored uh, fish from the Photo River. So I'll do another segment on those fish or on my Lake Turkana jewel cichlids which are different hemichromis then we also have just some red uh, hemichromis uh, over here that are, that are from West Africa but back to our species at hand so the crazy species <laughs> my mean species uh, they like really well oxygenated water so I leave uh, hang off the back filter running all the time uh, that's a little bit plugged up uh, here and that way it kind of uh, back spills out like a waterfall plus it has its normal flow uh, it's for a 75 gallon so it's it's more than enough uh, flow for them and biological filtration but they actually like waters, unlike a lot of cichlids um, that you may think of from from Africa. They like waters that are um, very uh, low TDS, ideally, and high oxygenation. And then they, they really like uh, the water to be uh, moving, so full of the oxygen, like I just said. I'm trying to get down low here to get a shot of this guy, the big guy going to town. and maybe doing some sifting here um, but he's more concerned about protecting his little lady friend in the cave over there now these two for a long time for almost a year they wouldn't use that cave they wanted to use the more rock shelter uh, sl slate uh, stacked up kind of like um, Stonehenge st uh, style of living arrangement but um, now they've taken to a large pre-made cave, and she seems to like that. He'll go in there with her, but he mostly defends the cave, so she'll lay the eggs in there. When they grow up, uh, he'll put them in his mouth and carry them around and uh, let them go out and feed on paramecium or baby brine shrimp or Daphne or whatever's in the water that we'll have to get in there for them. And... So it's good to have that stuff on hand. But you can see what voracious eaters these guys are. I mean, he tore my net just for being in there. And now, I mean, he'll scare off the other fish. But they don't just uh, chase. They'll actually slam and bite and nip. And so the catfish, the petricolas, they know uh, to stay out of the way of that alpha male. So really, you need at least a 40 breeder for the alpha male and a female. Uh, or you could do two females and a male, uh, but definitely one will arise as the main male. Now I hear if you get numbers over, um, you know, over eight or nine, that then the aggression kind of diffuses a little bit again, but then you're gonna need a tank 
bigger than a 40 breeder by far because this guy demands at least half the 40 breeder to himself of the entire bottom of the tank um, and he's very uh, patrolling he checks every little corner and he's very inquisitive they're definitely a very intelligent uh, cichlid species from what I can tell um, from from observation you know their eyes lock onto things and then they'll go fiddle with them <laughs> so the TDS you want to have that the dis total dissolved solids um, you want to have some buffering so that nothing crashes or anything uh, obviously uh, but this is uh, rainwater from the wet season from monsoons that they live in coming down the river uh, evolutionarily the history of their species speaking uh, the last 60 years or so have been a little bit different for them, but uh, I think it's best to go by the way they used to live. And so uh, that would be a TDS somewhere between 50 and 200 um, at the highest. And uh, obviously there's swings when the, you're right on the equator like they are, uh, and so you see differences uh, depending on that, but uh, of the TDS and of the acidity. But they can also withstand uh, nat uh, neutral to somewhat alkaline water, even though for spawning and things they like uh, neutral to 6.0, 6.5, somewhere in there, uh, water to kind of simulate that that uh, season of, of leaf debris and tannins and uh, biological matter uh, in the water uh, with them. So. They love eating worms, obviously, but they'll eat any little insect. They'll eat uh, any sort of little uh, Daphnia or critters that are in the tank when they're small. But then as they get bigger, they want bigger meals, obviously. Uh, so uh, blood worms, black worms, uh, and like I said, even snails. Even though I haven't found much literature on that, they definitely eat snails when they're in their territory or on the rocks near their nest. And you can see there he spit out something else again. So I don't know. Uh, sometimes they'll be eating snails if I don't feed them uh, every single day. He, he's sifting again uh, through his gills there. So the cool thing about this fish is they will adapt to eating uh, some flake food and pellets like uh, fluval bug bites. As long as it's high in protein, they'll take... Uh, a stab at it and eat it uh, and the other thing that's nice is they stay low in the tank so uh, they don't come to the surface other than eating uh, pretty much at all uh, unless they're gonna maybe check something out like they're just curious but they just pop up and then go straight back down and it's kind of fun to watch them because they'll perch up on uh, rocks and things and they are actually able to withstand the flow of, uh, of uh, three to four knots in the tank. So you could put a really strong power head on them and they'll just hang out in there like nothing's going on. So sometimes I'll put the power head in here and really uh, kick things up and uh, they just sit there and they actually articulate right at their uh, pectoral fins and they sit very much like a goby would on a rock, kind of bent at the chest and just facing the flow of the water. Uh, it's pretty cool to see. They also need to have some uh, vegetative matter in their diet, but again, protein is the main thing that they want to eat. And uh, like I said, the males get pretty rowdy, so when feeding, you wanna make sure that you feed the other ones is what you know the the non-dominant ones as much as the dominant ones me just acknowledging the presence of the subdominant male caused him to go all the way across the 40 breeder and uh false attack him uh but he'll he'll seriously attack him also so uh you have to be careful with these um they'll fit nicely in a victorian or congo uh biotope uh, as well as the West African biotope just because the water chemistry is pretty similar with that neutral water um, and some of the fish that are a little more aggressive that are in the big lakes and things like Aplochromus and some of the other Interiochromus uh, species that have yet to been, be sorted they seem to hold their own uh, pretty well too uh, whereas these guys will just bulldoze Crebensis and um, if you want, I mean, if you try something 
uh, South American or Central American uh, like convicts or parrots, they definitely will bulldoze and bully them. Also, same with apistos uh, and a number of other fish that I've seen uh, kept with them short term or that I've tried keeping with them short term. I tried the Honduran red points and uh, I also tried uh, the Crebensis when neither one worked out, they were just too aggressive. Uh, so, again, get yourself at least uh, two or three male and female or two females and a male at the bare minimum and better yet get yourself a group of like five or six and hope that you got like two males and the rest female um, or if if you don't you know you can always have a larger group and three or four males and supposedly then they spread out the aggression a little bit more but I hope this has been a really thorough rundown of these fish of where they're from and the problem they're facing uh not so much overfishing or anything like that just the fact that their habitat is gone and this is going on on the zingu river right now in uh or chingu river in uh the amazon and uh the Mon at the montobello dam and uh you know it really can kill entire uh lakes ecosystems so Keep in mind uh, these things uh, as you uh, champion causes uh, for removing dams or uh, fish ladders or reestablishing populations, things like that. Uh, so that is the lovely blue lip buffalo head cichlid. Uh, I love these fish. They're really cool. I just wish I had a bigger tank, like a 120 or a 90. So they had a little more room to roam and to see if they calm down themselves a little bit. But again, the Latin name is the Para uh, Gobio uh, Cicla Irvini. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this deep dive and uh, look at my savage little fish. Not so little fish. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later. Please like and subscribe for more deep dives content. And uh, let me know what species you'd like to hear about next. And if you are into breeding any of these West African cichlids or you know of something that can go in the tank with them that you think would work well, go ahead and let me know. Because the babies do hang up, hang out in higher water and they're starting to bug all my bettas now. <laughs> so uh, no matter what I do, this plan uh, seems to go awry. And uh, the barbs are the only ones that can really stay away. Uh, with the exception of uh, the catfish being able to sneak away in between rocks and things. So, all right, guys, I'll talk to you later. Have a good one. Bye.